The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our third speaker today is Mr. David Reed. Uh, David's a concrete engineer in the Materials Engineering and Research Office of the Ontario Ministry of Transportation. David has over 25 years experience in the cement and concrete industry, working in both the private sector and more recently in the government sector. He's been in, involved with the development and the implementation of new products and processes throughout his career, and he holds an MBA with a specialize, specialization in sustainability from the Schulich School of Business at York University. Today he's going to talk about the evaluation of photocatalytic concrete technology by the province of Ontario. Thank you very much, Hannah. I think I get to talk, I get to bring us back outside again and have some fun that way. And part of what I'm going to talk to today is both introducing a new technology, photocatalytic concrete, or if you want to say a little more sexy term, smog-eating concrete or self-cleaning concrete. So I'll both introduce the technology and where our testing is to date with it. Photocatalytic concrete. It's a concrete that contains titanium dioxide. Uh, and in the presence of sunlight, it helps to accelerate the natural oxid oxidization that happens out in the air. So it does both a self-cleaning and it will actually eat smog. What is titanium dioxide? It's a very abundant, non-toxic material. We're probably all using it in different forms for many years, including it's in your toothpaste, it's in your makeup, and uh, sometimes more controversially, it's even in some skin milk powders. Just to give an idea, of, we're working with a white powder that's being introduced to the concrete now. Um, there's been research. The product's been used since the 70s. Yeah, if anyone's been involved in a new house renovation or put in a nice shower or something like that, the self-cleaning glass that you get in washrooms now is typically a product that includes this technology. And getting now we're getting more similar to the concrete aspect of it. And so basically it's been in place since the 70s, but more recently it's just getting introduced to concrete. And I'll share, show a few examples for you. Uh, basically other research that's out there starts to let you know, you know results suggesting anywhere from 50 to 350 milligrams a day of nitrogen dioxide can be taken out of the air. What does that mean? Well, if we look at an area of concrete, say the size of a soccer field, that can take away 190,000 car kilometers in a year. To me, that starts to put a little, and that's using a, a relatively small number from the researchers' reports. And in addition to that, it has the potential, and I say potential because there hasn't been a lot of research quantifying you know, how much it can impact sulfate, sulfur dioxides, uh, particular matter in addition to the nitrogen dioxide areas. Just to give some examples. The church on the top left of your screen, built you know, more than 10 years ago. Now, its main focus was in the self-cleaning aspect in Italy, but very beautiful and showing up very well. The other projects here on the top right, when we're talking in Belgium, that's a street with interlocking paving blocks. And there, they're showing good field results. It can even be used in a tunnel, as shown in the photo on the bottom left. Uh, with artificial light as long as we're getting some UV out of that artificial light. 
And a more recent trial here in North America, it's down in Missouri, and it's part of a two-lift concrete pavement technology, and they're just getting started now on doing some of the monitoring for it. For the would-be chemists in the room, I had to show something uh, with a little bit of chemistry here for you. I don't really want to go through the numbers or the, what's going on here, but two points I want you to share with. One, it's a, a multi-part chemical reaction. It takes a little bit of time. You're converting in a few stages. And the other key point here is when you get to the final numbers here, it's an inoculate per precipitate, calcium nitrites and nitrates. So something that can easily wash off a wall and be relatively harmless in our environment. Why, you know, what's MTO's involvement here? This is a new product that's part of our strategy or objective to have the greenest roads in Ontario, or in North America. Um, what we want to look at is we want to assess this particular material, and with our partners, the University of Toronto, and the lead researchers here in the room, and I'll introduce you at the end, we, you know, we want to look at the concrete aspects of it. We also want to work with our environmental arm, our Ministry of Environment here in Ontario, and partner with them and see if we can physically see these uh, air quality improvements in the air that we're breathing through some of their test equipment. And more importantly now, based on these results, we want to see how can we go forward? What's the right type of project to take it to larger scale demonstration? The trial I'm going to talk about is along North America's uh, busiest highway with a, an annual traffic, daily traffic volume, 450,000 vehicles a day. It's part of a noise barrier re replacement project. Doesn't look sexy, it's concrete noise barriers, but this was a, and as we look to the right, the five bays that you see there, they're all the photocatalytic concrete, and then we also put in same cement but non-photocatalytic to assess a field assessment of these. And by the way, the, this photocatalytic concrete is a proprietary product that was supplied to us from uh, SROC Italia Cemente Group, and they've helped us in setting up some of the uh, research protocols for us as well. I'll do the brief introduction to the Canadian cement. Uh, made reference here, and I will a few times, to GU cement. That's the general use cement, and that's comparable to the ASTM Type 1. This program's part of a two-year uh, air monitoring program that we've got in place. Um, we're really only about halfway through, so we're sharing some interim results. But what we're doing is we're using real live air monitoring equipment, and we've put two in place. Uh, there's two side-by-side -side units. They're identical, and the intent is to put one close to the wall to measure, hopefully, the improvement we see from the photocatalytic concrete, and the other further away, but as close as possible, to still represent the similar environment, and it's the difference between these two units that could give us some assessment in terms of how much it's been able to improve for us. Before we get into the research, we had to do a control. And this is what this screen's showing us. Uh, here we did a background air monitoring, our location, but before we installed the photocatalytic panels. There, the slide says you see two different color bars here. And these are using our two units. They're almost superimposed on top of each other. So if your eyesight's getting a little weak, maybe like mine, you, it's hard to see some of the yellow of the second one. What we've done here, this is control. And here what we're trying to capture is location bias. If one that's two meters further away from the wall, but possibly two meters closer to the pollution source, is there a difference? And from these graphs, it's suggesting, no, we're not getting a location bias. So this helps us in establishing our control force. Now we go on and we manufacture uh, our panels. The panels are made by Duracell, a large North American manufacturer of sound walls. Uh, this was made in their Mitchell, Ontario plant. And as I briefly mentioned already, 
The cement was supplied to us from S. Rockatelli Cemente, their Front Royal West Virginia plant for their photocatalytic cement, and we also used that same source of cement for our control as well. So we've got good comparisons to go with. And of course, before we take something out into the field, we wanted to verify it in the labs. And in the cement suppliers' labs, we went through two establishing protocols for measuring, um, I should smog reduction or uh, nitrogen dioxide consumption. And what these tests have been, are being established in Europe and Japan. And they use two different premises, one that has a longer retention time and one that's a straight through flow through. And I apologize if I'm starting to get a little technical there, but we wanted to make sure we knew we were working with a good product before we took it out to the field. Our laboratory reductions showed uh, reductions of about 25%. So we've got a reasonable base to go forward. Now we take this out to the field. Our first monitoring campaigns basically last year at this time as well as we started a second one in June. We're just getting ready to start a third one in about another week or two from now. And as you take a closer look, those tube things are the actual monitoring inlets. One's very close to the wall and one's further out about, about two meters from the wall. Now, our first field air quality measurements. Uh, again, we've got the two different colors, the red and the yellow. In this case, the red's the fixed, being close to the wall. Unfortunately, they're somewhat overlapping here. Uh, and as I say, we're still in the, in the middle of this process. What this result's tending to say is we're not capturing the reduction through our test method. Yeah, so we've gone back to the drawing room board a little bit to examine this a little further. Some of the discussions around this. One of the first things our air monitoring was showing us is we're getting a predominant wind in the vicinity. Uh, now when we compare the actual wind to the wind that's, or the airflow that's used in the laboratory tests, we're many times a lot greater. And taking into account that this is a complex reaction, are we getting enough contact time or resonance time to actually see the reduction in the field so far? We're also a little pleasantly surprised that on Ontario's busiest highway, our nitrogen dioxide levels are actually a little lower than we had anticipated. Is that having an impact on it? Uh, as we go and look at other research, clearly it indicates light intensity, contact time, direction, even relative humidity and temperature play significant factors in, cap in identifying and capturing how well this process does. Uh, we've just done a couple seasons. We're going to continue going forward, but we're also proposing other means of measuring. Before I mention what we're going to try, sharing with you what some other researchers have done around the world. The top one here is from Belgium. And I showed one of those earlier slides, the Belgian example of the road with the interlocking paving stones. They've used a test method here that puts a panel directly over the paving stones that are in place, injects their nitrogen dioxide in one end, and then measures the reduction coming out the other end. Much more controlled than our optimistic view of trying to just measure the, the wind and see what we get. Or an approach at the bottom here, which instead of measuring the air quality improvement, do you measure how much of the nitrates are collecting on the wall? And you know those nitrates came from the air, so that could be another means of an indirect measure. So at this stage, as we're looking at interim results, we're saying our direct field measurements have not been able to detect the air quality improvement yet. But what we don't know is, is that the panels, in their performance, or is that a, our performance and how we identify the test method? Yeah, orientation of our wall. Our wall, the one that we got, was based on convenience and easy access and safe access. Um, its orientation is more northwest, so it doesn't have the sun intensity that we otherwise would have liked as an example. But 
or if we went to a more a ribbed wall, would that give us much longer detention time or contact time? Anyway, we're going to move to the other side of the wall. We're going to get away from the, the natural wind, and we're going to go to more intense sunlight and see if those can help us in our test measuring. Just briefly, the second half of what we're doing is a laboratory evaluation. This is part of some of the research that gets carried out from the Ministry of Transportation in our infrastructure innovation funding program and our research partners with this is the University of Toronto. Here now we're comparing the mechanical, the transport, uh, the durability properties of the concrete itself and comparing that back to ordinary concrete. Are there any differences? To give you some interim results here and the top line we're Compressive strength, we're seeing plus or minus 3 to 5 percent on compressive strength. I would say that's within normal testing variation. One thing in the plastic properties, we'll, at first sight, the slump of the normal concrete is higher at the same fixed water cement ratio, and so is the plastic air content. But just to qualify, our hardened air content came in within an acceptable type range, and our air spacing factors are there. So at least those give a good level playing field for us to go ahead on the durability of evaluation. And when we look at some of the hardened properties, ultrasonic pulse velocity, initial absorptivity, we're finding them very comparable across. Durability factor, although not quite at the end, we're getting near the end of the cycles, again they're showing very comparable results. Rapid chloride permeability, when you compare GU against photocatalytic, again, we're very comparable. And when we compare with slag in it to photocatalytic with slag, again, very comparable. And the only difference we found so far in our interim results is the result scaling. And we've gone on to repeat some of these tests right now, and that's underway. But we have found an earlier tendency to see more salt scaling right now with the photocatalytic. So some of our interim conclusions with our laboratory study. Basically, we're seeing the physical properties of the photocatalytic concrete appear compatible, comparable with conventional concrete. Higher water demand, higher air and training dosages are required. And clearly, admixtures do need to be checked for compatibility with the photocatalytic cement. And we did do that working with the cement supplier in this case but it's something that we need to be aware of going forward. There may be more of a salt scaling susceptibility, but right now the freeze off resistance does show to be there. And these were important for us because not only do we want to see the smog eating benefits, we want to see that all other aspects of this concrete work well as well. So we're continuing some further investigation, incorporating some high range water reducers and repeating some of the durability assessments to see how that goes. So at this stage in our progress, we're going, yes, our field air quality monitoring hasn't shown us a result that we're looking for. We haven't seen the reductions, but we're not sure if that's a measurement or methods or if it's actually the barrier, you know, the materials and where it's located at this stage. And that basically the plastic and hardened properties are comparable so at this stage, I'd like to acknowledge my, the partners in this from the University of Toronto, the Ministry of Environment, Duracell or ARMTAC as they're known now, and SROC. We do have some more information, um, something the Ministry of Transportation publishes regularly. It's Road Talk. It's available on the internet. And I've also put a file folder over near the door for some who might want to take a handout. Thank you. It's being held up in the air. But otherwise, photocatalytic and Ministry of Transportation will get you there in the, on a web search as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>